On September 20, 2025, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Michael Mike McCoy, age 62, and his wife Heather, also 62, lost their lives when their North American AT-6 Texan, tail number November 32, Sierra Zulu, crashed at a small fly-in gathering near Louise, Texas. And here's what really makes this so striking. Mike wasn't just any weekend pilot. He was a decorated fighter pilot, a warbird pilot, someone with thousands of hours of experience in demanding aircraft. So how in the world does a guy like that, flying a machine he knows intimately, lose control in broad daylight at a grassroots event? That's the question. The crash happened during the under-the-wire fly-in at the Flying V Ranch, a long-running family-style aviation gathering. It's usually dominated by Stearman biplanes, big, slow, classic open cockpit trainers that love to cruise low and slow over the grass strip. But this year, Mike brought his AT-6 Texan, a much heavier, faster World War II-era advanced trainer. Right away, you've got a recipe for mixing very different performance envelopes in the same pattern. Now, what does the data show us? From ADSB Exchange, we can piece together some of the last moments. About 95 knots at 900 feet, then later 73 knots at just 600 feet, while turning base toward the grass runway. That's slow for a T6. And we're not talking about some cushy cruise altitude. This is low pattern work, with very little altitude to play with if anything goes wrong. Photographs taken at the event show the AT-6 entering the frame already in a fully stalled condition. You can see the belly of the airplane, nose dropped, right wing dipped, the classic look of a Texan breaking to the right when it stalls. And here's the frustrating part. At this altitude, recovery isn't just hard, it's basically impossible. Once that airplane departed controlled flight in the pattern, the game was over. So the big question becomes, why did the stall happen here? This is where the aerodynamic story really matters. Let's back up and talk about what a stall actually is. A lot of non-pilots think a stall means the engine quit or the plane stopped moving. Not true. A stall happens when the wing exceeds its critical angle of attack. Angle of attack is simply the angle between the wing and the oncoming airflow. If that angle gets too steep, the airflow separates, lift collapses, and the wing stalls. Now here's the kicker. Stall speed isn't a fixed number carved into the airplane's DNA. It changes depending on how you're flying. If you're straight and level, sure, the AT6 might stall at one number, but throw in a bank turn, like the base to final turn, and everything changes. When you bank, the wing has to produce more lift to support the aircraft's weight. More lift means higher load factor, and higher load factor means a higher stall speed. At 60 degrees of bank, stall speed doesn't just creep up, it skyrockets by around 40%. So imagine this. Mike is flying a big, heavy Texan slowly, trying to slot in behind much slower steermans in the pattern. He's banked in a turn, close to the ground, trying to stay tight. That's the situation where your stall margin shrinks to almost nothing. And that's exactly what appears to have happened. The AT-6 hit its critical angle of attack, the wing gave up, and the airplane snapped into a stall. And that right there is the really crazy part. A maneuver that might feel normal, just tightening up the turn a little more, or pulling back a little extra to stay on the glide path, can suddenly push you over the edge. It doesn't matter how experienced you are, physics doesn't care. If you exceed the wing's limits in a low-altitude turn, you're out of options. Now here's where things get really crazy. The AT-6 and the Stearman might both be old-school airplanes, but they're not even close when it comes to speed and handling. The AT-6's stall speed in a base-to-final turn is basically the same as a Stearman's cruise speed. That means if you're trying to sequence behind one in the pattern, you're instantly forced into flying slower than what's really safe for the Texan. And that's not even the whole story. Add in wake turbulence. These vortices, 
the swirling air that trails off the wingtips, don't just disappear when you get close to the ground. In fact, they tend to linger longer at low altitude and high lift conditions, which is exactly where this accident happened. The Stearman being a biplane actually complicates things even more. With two wings, you're not just shedding two vortices like a normal monoplane, you're shedding four. And with two Stearmans flying in sequence before the AT-6, McCoy's airplane was flying through a kind of invisible minefield of disturbed air. So, combine those factors. An AT-6 forced to fly slow in a bank close to the ground while also potentially rolling into or out of disturbed wake. That's an environment where the margin for error is razor thin. And the conclusion is brutal. Putting faster, heavier warbirds in the same tight pattern with slow, draggy biplanes creates a hazard that even the most experienced pilot can't always outfly. But let's talk about the human side of this, because airplanes don't crash on their own. Even with decades of military flying under his belt, Mike McCoy still ended up in a deadly corner. Why? Part of it is event culture. Fly-ins, especially grassroots ones, are about camaraderie, nostalgia, and sometimes just a little bit of showmanship. Nobody wants to be that guy who goes around or breaks out of the pattern, even if that's the safest move. There's also a subtle kind of social pressure when you're flying alongside your friends or in front of a crowd. The temptation to make it work instead of disrupting the flow can override the conservative choice. Another factor is visual closure rates. When you're following a slower airplane, it's deceptively easy to think you've got plenty of spacing. But the slower that lead aircraft goes, the more your own closure sneaks up on you, especially in an AT-6, which is big, heavy, and carries a lot of inertia. And honestly, this is what's extremely frustrating. Even the best pilots are still human. Skill and experience don't cancel out physics. If you're boxed into an unsafe operating envelope, flying too slow in a steep bank with wake turbulence in play, your resume doesn't matter. We've seen this before. A very similar accident happened in Wayne, Nebraska, when a Cessna 140 stalled and spun behind a slower Zenith. Different airplanes, same trap. So what do we take away from this? Because this accident really shows the blind spot that exists in a lot of these community events. First, pilot briefings matter. If you're going to have a mix of airplanes, fast warbirds, slow antiques, ultralights, whatever, you can't just throw them all in the same pattern and hope everyone figures it out. There should be hard rules on who flies when, or even separate circuits for different performance groups. Second, a dedicated radio coordinator can make a world of difference. Somebody on the ground with a handheld radio who can sequence traffic, call out spacing issues, and tell somebody to go around if things get tight. It's not as good as ATC, but it's way better than nothing. Third, and this is the big one, pilots need to normalize go-arounds and breakouts. There's no shame in climbing out, respacing, and coming back. The FAA wake turbulence guidance is clear. Don't get close. Don't get low behind heavy or slow traffic. It applies just as much at a country strip as it does at a major airport. At the end of the day, events like under the wire are supposed to be fun. But fun can't come at the expense of safety. And if we want to honor the memory of Mike and Heather McCoy, the real way to do it is to learn from what happened here and evolve the culture at these fly-ins so this kind of accident doesn't happen again. Thank you for watching. Hit subscribe so you don't miss it when the report comes out. See you in the next video.